what a way to start a Friday. I lay on my back and propped my head up with a pillow. Thursday night, we spent two hours without getting out of bed. After a few pleasurable minutes, Jeanette, my wife of three years, squealed and twitched. She gasped, and her body shook from the pleasurable sensations. Her head fell on my chest. Life is good. That's all you get until Monday. Are you afraid the others will get jealous when they hear your joyful screams? Something like that. Well, in that case, you get until Monday, too. That made me giggle and roll my eyes. And so began our Friday. We both took the day off. Jeanette took Monday off as well. I was running out of vacation time, so we would return Sunday night so I could start work on Monday. We were headed to the mountains for a weekend of skiing. Jeanette's best friend Tatiana and her husband Steve had rented a cabin with us about five miles from the ski resort. We did the same trip with them a year ago. Another couple will be joining us on Saturday. Tatiana was Jeanette's maid of honor and vice versa at both weddings a month apart. Steve is a typical high school athlete who has no talent to go further. All he seems to be able to talk about is his glory days. I can probably replicate most of his home runs, game-winning baskets, and touchdown passes. For whatever reason, Jeanette and Tatiana were both athletes in high school. They were starters on both the volleyball and basketball teams. They have the same build, each approaching six slender feet tall. Probably because she's heard them so many more times than I have, Tatiana just stares at nothing as Steve tells his stories. It's not that I didn't participate in high school sports. I was the starting point guard on the junior varsity team three years in a row. They don't allow high school seniors to play on the junior varsity team, so I devoted my efforts to college classes. Although Steve has a college degree, I would never have recruited him. In fact, all four of us have college degrees. I still need to do my thesis, and that could delay things. According to my mentor, I should plan something in the 60-page range. I've done an outline, but it's going to burden me. I guess that's the way it should be. Having a mastermind says something to employers. Don't forget to bring your golf club so we have room for groceries. Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Nice. Just do it. I headed for the garage. As the garage door crept up, a light flashed under my car. Since I had changed the oil yesterday, I decided to check it. Grabbing a folded tarp, I unfolded it and threw it on the concrete floor. Kneeling down, I saw a few drops under the oil pan. Poking at it with my finger, I had no doubt it was oil. How hard is it to make sure the oil drain plug is tight? Apparently, a lot tighter than I thought it would be. Slipping out from under the car, I grabbed my socket kit and moved within striking distance. Of course, I tightened the bolt about half a turn. The place was cozy now. Oh, crap. I forgot a paper towel. One more time, back and forth, and the problem was fixed. I put the tarp back on and went inside to wash my hands. You ready to go? Almost. Let me wash up first. What did you get into? They undid the oil pan bolt. They may be cheap, but you gotta make sure they work. Hurry up or we'll be late. Yes, sir. This elicited a stern look from me, complete with tightened lips. We met Tatiana and Steve at the grocery store near the cottage, if you can call ten miles near. You'd think we'd be staying for a month. Two full shopping carts, that's something. Opening the trunk, I saw my golf clubs. Damn it, Dale, I told you to take them out. The back seat was littered with sleeping bags and suitcases. They were joined by a mishmash of groceries. Only a few bags fit in the trunk. Jeanette was silent for the last stretch to the cabin. Once we reached the cabin, we began emptying the cars. I started in our back seat. After a few trips, Tatiana and I would return to the cars. We passed Jeanette and Steve with our hands full. Tatiana grabbed the last bag of groceries out of the car. I heard her trunk slam shut. I was a little behind Tatiana walking to my car. My trunk was open with two bags still in there. In the distance, we heard a very loud explosion. Tatiana and I looked up the mountain and saw the beginning of a small avalanche. I've seen it happen twice now. They fall in a cascade for about ten seconds and then stop. This time it was different. What started out as something about twenty feet across had now expanded to several hundred feet. You could hear it coming, the sound of the train approaching. Fuck! It's heading toward us! To the car! Get in the car! Slamming the trunk shut, I jumped into the driver's seat, and Tatiana slid into my car into the passenger seat. The approaching noise was frightening. 
we both watched in horror as the snowy mountain approached. Brace for impact! I jammed my head into the steering wheel. Tatiana pulled up her knees and curled up in a ball. The impact pushed my car like a puck on ice. A minute later, we hit something hard. I suspect it was only a few seconds, but I feared for my life. At one point, I heard Tatiana scream, like a teenager on a roller coaster going down the first drop. I felt like my chest was going to explode. My heart rate must have been over a hundred. I had a headache. It was completely dark. I'm alive. Are you okay, Tatiana? I think I'm okay. My head hurts a little bit. It feels like we're tilted. I agree, your side is higher than mine. I found the light switch and turned it on. Let there be light. You have blood right above your right eye, Tatiana said worriedly. Check me out. Hmm, nice hair, slim, cute smile. Check what exactly? Giggling. I take it I'm not bleeding. Well, not where I can see, I winked. Tatiana blushed. For a few minutes, we sat in silence. I tried to open the door, but we were pinned down tight. Next to the front right tire, we could see a large, dark area without snow. The lighting wasn't great, but it looked like a few very large trees made a roof over our heads. If we could plug into this hole, we would have enough oxygen to survive for a few days. We would have to be sure to run a fan to circulate the carbon dioxide. It's not the lack of oxygen that kills you. It's the CO2 reaching lethal levels. Did you happen to bring the last bag of groceries with you? Tatiana shook her head negatively and asked, Do you think Steve and Jeanette survived? I don't know. I've never seen what happens to cabins when an avalanche of that size hits them. My heart dropped. What if Jeanette didn't make it? My eyes clouded over, and I wiped away a few tears. Tatiana seemed to have done the same. I guess we're not quite alive yet either, are we? Not until we breathe in some sun-warmed air. I wonder if anyone will realize we're buried. I pressed the klaxon. It worked. At least we had a way to signal the rescuers. Every hour or so, or whenever we hear activity, we can honk. After an hour of almost complete silence, Tatiana announced, I don't want to die. Agreed. I didn't realize today was my last day on Earth. Even though we don't have phone service, I'm going to draft some texts telling those I love how much I love them. What a great idea. I wish I had my phone with me. I would have done the same thing. You can use my phone. I typed for about ten minutes before emotions overwhelmed me. Handing the phone to Tatiana, she had the same feelings. For the next two hours, we passed each other the phone. We each wrote several messages from the afterlife. We heard nothing. The battery seemed to be holding up well, but we turned off the dome lights as we rested. I'm a little cold, Tatiana said worriedly. I wish we had emptied the trunk first. The sleeping bags were still in the back seat. There's a way to get into the trunk by lowering the back seats. I have winter gloves and rain gear. I think I have windbreakers. Climbing into the back seat, I fumbled for the latch. It worked. Using my cell phone for light, I poked my head into the trunk. Within a minute, I was already in gloves, hats, coats, and rain gear. I also grabbed the last two bags of groceries. Delicious celery sticks, frozen cauliflower, and potato chips were the highlights. We weren't going to starve. Remembering that I had a couple energy drinks in my golf bag, I pulled them out of the trunk. I couldn't help but laugh when I saw Tatiana in a golf suit. Warmer? Yeah, that really helps. Can I offer you a stick of celery? If it's not too much trouble. I'll make an exception for you. I stretched out in the back seat and put on the rest of my golf suit. Tatiana lowered the passenger seat as low as she could. Too bad we don't have a blanket, Tatiana said. Hey, I have tiny towels that I use to wipe my clubs with. We could cover our faces with them. We could pull up the mats. It's not much, but it might help. That's what we did. We each took one. We threw them over ourselves, then covered our faces with small towels. That really helped. We closed our eyes and rested. When I woke up, I realized I had slept for two hours. Tatiana was purring, as women like to describe her snoring. Instead of waking her up by honking, I lay there contemplating my life and current predicament. I don't want to die. Will they find us before the spring thaw? Will we die an hour before they find us? My mom will be desperate. I hope Jeanette survived. Startled, Tatiana woke up and screamed. 
It's okay, Tatiana, I'm right here. It was a horrible dream, Dale. I saw our skeletons in the car. I don't want to die. Without asking Tatiana, I climbed into the back seat. Her warmth was nice. I'm not going to deny it. What time is it? Just after 7 p.m. The sun's been down for almost two hours. That's why it's getting colder. Are we going to starve to death, freeze to death, or run out of oxygen? I think we're fine with everything except freezing. I could use some water. Turning the ignition key, I discovered that the driver's side window was jammed shut. Both passenger windows were down a few inches. I checked to see if they would come back up and lowered them again. We took the opportunity to eat some snow to get some water. With a little effort, we managed to punch a hole into the darkness. We had a supply of oxygen. After running the fan for ten minutes, I raised the windows again. With our constant klaxon signal, I could only hope that somewhere in the distance someone was thinking, what was that noise? Tatiana spoke what I was thinking. I need to pee. Me too. Suggestions? It looks like the car is tilted toward the left front tire. I'm gonna drive. Don't look at me, you pervert. Wait, let me get my camera and take a video. You'll die from the beating if you do that. Sounds and smells of urine filled the car. Finished, Tatiana returned to the passenger seat. I ungrudgingly took my place in the driver's seat. I emptied my bladder, turned the key, and the windows slid down. Since the window was down, I turned on the fan. After lamenting our predicament, we tried to settle in for the evening. After lying still for about 30 minutes, Tatiana asked, Are you going to be good? Is that what you want me to do? What I want and what I know I'm obligated to do at a given moment in time are two completely different things. I think you should hold me because I don't want to be accused of poking you all night long. Tatiana climbed into the back seat, leaned against the backrest, and pulled me to her. Press against me harder. I'm freezing. Covering us with the mats, Tatiana put her right hand on my chest, pulling me closer. The warmth of her body was too pleasant. If her hand moved lower, my discomfort would be revealed. With our faces covered in golf towels, sleep eventually overtook us. I didn't know how long we slept, but Tatiana pushed me away. Rolling off to the side, I watched Tatiana take a seat in the driver's seat. The sounds and smells of urine filled the car again. A glance at the clock told me it was almost 5 a.m. Tatiana once again set up our cuddle position. Neither of us wanted to sleep. What will you do if Jeanette dies? I don't understand the question. Are you going to leave or are you going to stay here? What about you? What if Steve's dead? I'll probably move in with my parents until I get over my grief. How much time do we have? About a week, I grinned. We have plenty of water and we'll probably have enough food for another three or four days. It's hard to tell if we have enough oxygen. Is there someone looking for us? Since it's the highway department, I hope so. I snuggle up to Tatiana again. Her hand slides under my shirt. The warm touch of flesh against flesh felt good. For several hours, we talked about everything and nothing. After eating a few potato chips and finishing the celery, we made ourselves comfortable and soon fell asleep. When I woke up, I lay still. Tatiana was purring softly. I looked at the clock. It was approaching 5 p.m., and then I heard it. A thump barely audible. Tatiana, I heard something. I started honking as three short beeps, three long beeps, and three short beeps. Tatiana hummed softly. Please, please, please. We were silent for a minute, and then we both heard a thump. I repeated S-O-S. Then Eureka, their probing pole landed right on the car. I pressed the klaxon and didn't release it until the pole hit the car again. Even if you know you're going to be rescued, the longer it went on, the more worried I got. Why did it take so long? Tatiana snuggled against me as I leaned over the driver's seat. Every now and then, another probe hit the car. Then we heard voices. Almost there. Hang in there. The sound of metal against metal never felt so good. I pressed the klaxon again. The light of a miner's lantern was shining through the snow. An older guy, shrouded, grinned at us. He brushed the snow off the driver's door. I tried to open it, but the snow was still in the way. A couple more minutes of shoveling, and I felt the door start to open. The clatter of his shovel against the door was followed by my door swinging open about six inches. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. No big deal, the man replied. After helping me and then Tatiana to the surface, we were greeted by darkness. There were probably 20 people there with miner's hat lights burning. They covered us with blankets, gave us a bottle of water, and tied us to the sled. Is the cabin still standing? What cabin? My heart dropped. We're staying at 24,269 Pine Way. There are two people there. He repeated my information into the microphone. After talking for a while, he approached us again. We haven't found the cabin. It's too dark now, but we'll be back in the morning. Let's get you both to the hospital. You were under 15 feet of snow. We heard your car horn this afternoon, so we're working late into the night. You ready? Tatiana clung to me, wrapping both arms around my waist, and we were dragged to the ambulance. After a warm ride, we ended up in the emergency room and attracted a lot of attention. I had to get two stitches in the wound above my right eyebrow. Such was the extent of our wounds. There was no indication that hypothermia had reached a critical level. Despite this, we still spent the night in the hospital getting fluids and slowly getting our body temperature back to normal. Tatiana was released first thing in the morning, but she was waiting for me. I talked to the emergency workers. They had found the cabin and there were signs of life. My heart was singing. I picked Tatiana up and turned her around. She leaned over and kissed my cheek. For what? For being a true gentleman. You were so calm. I don't know if I could have handled it on my own. I know it would have been different with Steve. He would have been completely lost. So thanks again. You're welcome, and thank you too. You kept your cool, which only helped me. Who's in charge of the rescue? I found this guy in the cafeteria. I think they set up a command center in there. Well, let's go. The next two hours were brutal. Not a word from the search party. It was about 12.30 when we got the news. From the man in charge, there are two survivors. We need to bring in heavy equipment because the walls have collapsed. They must have been lucky to be in a place that wasn't completely destroyed. Any idea when you'll get to them? It's too early to tell. I'm dizzy. They're both alive. Please don't do any more damage with your bulldozers. Another wait followed. After a couple hours, we heard his message. They both got out safely. They will be here in 30 minutes. My eyes filled with tears. Thank you. Tatiana and I hugged again. I emptied my cell phone, letting all my relatives know what had happened. No one had the slightest clue. Everyone knew we had been skiing and hadn't connected the avalanche to our trip. Now everyone was agitated. I met Jeanette Stretcher, and Tatiana did the same with Steve. Both were filled with tears of reunion. It wasn't until after lunch that we were let into their rooms. We spent the first ten minutes cuddling together and whispering, I love you. Hey, baby. How was your weekend? Lots of snow, yours? Yeah, there were a few snowflakes. Her giggles were music to my ears. Her kisses were warm, and her hugs were divine. Tatiana and I managed to get into my car before it crashed. How did you two survive? Pure luck! We heard a loud roar and then boom. Chaos ensued. We were just putting things in the kitchen when it hit. I thought I was dead, but when the noise stopped, I realized I had survived. It was pitch dark, and I could hear Steve moaning. We had about three feet of clearance. We were standing in a spot about ten by twenty. That's the luck of the draw. Did you have food or blankets? A few apples and a mat on the floor? I thought we'd starve to death if we didn't freeze first. All we had was parkas on our backs and a rug. Any injuries? I got a lot of minor cuts and scrapes. Steve twisted his leg pretty bad. How long are they going to keep you? At least overnight. Our body temperature is dangerously low. One nurse said it's unlikely we'd survive another night. I kissed and hugged Jeanette. The visitors were asked to leave. Well, get a good night's sleep. I'll go home and get your car. I'll take your clothes and get you a new set. Jeanette nodded her head affirmatively, but then, almost in a panic, she pleaded, Dale, just leave them. I don't want to be reminded of this. I'll throw them away. Her hands reached for the bag I was holding. Really, Jeanette, it's not a problem. You'll never remember these were your clothes. Everything is practically brand new. I got it. Dale, just give them to me, please. Get some sleep. I'll see you in the morning. Dale, give me the damn bag. 
Jeanette, you're all worked up. Get some sleep. I'll see you in the morning. I think if she could get up, she'd jump me. That's weird. I waited for Tatiana. And indeed, the elevator took her to the lobby. How's he doing? Big kid. I swear he doesn't tolerate anything unpredictable. How's Jeanette? Pretty good, I think. She freaked out when I told her I was taking her clothes home. She just wanted to throw them away to erase the memory of the ordeal. Different strokes for different people seems really weird. I guess she didn't want me to see it. I agree. What about you? What did I do? Did you leave your clothes? No, it's all here in the bag. Can I? Tatiana sneaked a glance. Her expression changed immediately. Her eyes were wild. What a bastard! They were having sex. Look at her pants. They're sticky as hell. There's a lot more than one time. I'm going to kill him. Tatiana dropped her bag and headed for the stairs. The door slammed shut behind her. I stood stunned. How could she? She didn't act like she'd been raped. I sank heavily into the chair. My heart was breaking and my eyes clouded over. Rage began to overwhelm me. Ten minutes later, the guards escorted Tatiana back into the lobby. One of the guards stood ten feet away from her and warned her to behave or he would throw her out. He said they thought they were going to die. He didn't tell me how many times. Several, he replied. We thought we were going to die too. What the hell? I wanted to crash into something. I couldn't remember ever being so angry. After a moment of silence, tears streamed down our cheeks. The phone rang. In two minutes, Uber will be here. You can come with me. I'll take you home. Okay. She said quietly through her tears. It was an awkward hour. We were both in pain. When I pulled up in front of her house, Tatiana leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Hang in there, Dale. You too, Tatiana. Thanks for a fun weekend. A smile broke through the tears. You're someone I'll always remember. My ride home was a sad one. My emotions overwhelmed the entire board. Killing her, hugging her, leaving her, forgiving her, and finally asking, why? Sleep didn't come easily. In the morning, I did all the necessary procedures. Grabbing some food, I walked into my office. After explaining my weekend, I got today and tomorrow off. I returned home. Rummaging through Jeanette's clothes, I pulled out some sweatpants and matching underwear. Then I was filled with rage. Fucking bitch. I went looking again. Last Halloween, she was wearing a stripper costume. I found it and a lace thong. That's it. Since her drawers were open, I decided to move her stuff into the office bedroom. She could figure out how to move things around so that she could spread out the sleeper sofa. Back in our bedroom, I gathered the obvious feminine toiletries, filled the trash can with them, and then put the trash can with her clothes. It took me a while to work up the courage to enter Jeanette's room. Her parents and sister were fawning over her. Jeanette's eyes were red and swollen. After hugs and kisses with my relatives, I stared at Jeanette, mourning. The desire to strangle her to death gave way to a tender embrace. Is that all I get? I just nodded affirmatively. She knew I knew. Her lower lip trembled. Are you going to be released today? I think so. I was responding well to the IVs and blankets. No matter how disgusting their food tastes, I can't get enough of it. Jeanette felt uncomfortable. She couldn't look me in the eye. I'm going to get some coffee. Can I get anyone else anything? I'll go with you, son, said Fred, Jeanette's father. As soon as we were in the cafeteria, he looked me in the eye. What's going on, Dale? I thought you two were supposed to be in love with each other after the ordeal you've been through. Fred, I just want to confirm that things are not so rosy in our house. I'll let Jeanette tell you her side. That sounds bad. It is. I don't know what I'm going to do. We brought a tray full of coffee cups and donuts into the room. Jeanette wiped away her tears. After the tray was eaten, Fred gathered his group and left. Before Jeanette and I could talk, her doctor walked in and told her to pack up as she was ready to go home. And Jeanette grabbed the bag of clothes I had brought and went to the bathroom. It didn't take long for her to do that. Is this what you want me to wear? Act like a whore, dress like a whore. I thought we agreed not to have sex until Monday. Of course, we also made some vows that were crushed in an avalanche. 
Her face crumpled and she collapsed in the bathroom. She cried for about 30 minutes. Jeanette was in that suit when she came out, in her cracked voice, happy now? Not even close, let's go. A nurse arrived with a wheelchair. She had a look of genuine amazement on her face. I went out to bring the car to the entrance. Everyone stared at Jeanette as she got out of her wheelchair and headed for the passenger door. I didn't bother getting out to help her. The ride went on in silence for about five minutes. We thought we were going to die, Dale. So did we. But we didn't mess up our lives. That brought tears again, silence again. What happens now? Your stuff's in the study. The rest of the drive, she just sobbed quietly. When we got to the house, she pulled herself together and mumbled, I feel bad. Me too. My car was destroyed, and I began the process of getting my insurance company involved. I picked up my temporary vehicle. On the way home, I realized that being around Jeanette right now was not something I enjoyed. I sent her a text. Don't wait up. I'm not going home. Her reply was quick. Please come home, Dale. We can't work anything out if we don't talk. Too soon. I spent the evening at a sports bar watching college basketball and NHL hockey. It seems cheating husbands must give off a certain odor. A few hours later, a waitress asked me if I was coping with a cheating wife. She warned me that I couldn't drink away my problems. Yes, I agreed. <laughs> Jeanette was waiting for me when I stumbled in around 1.30 a.m., stumbling. I was worried about you. My inarticulate reply was something like, I wasn't. Pushing away her attempts to hug and kiss me, I closed the bedroom door and ducked into the middle of the bed. In the morning, Jeanette left a note saying she was at work and that she loved me. I couldn't hang around the house because there were too many good memories that only fueled my rage. I showed up around noon and worked until nine. Are you coming home tonight? Dinner's ready. It's too early. After stopping for a snack, I rolled in around 10 p.m. I had to work again in the morning, and I couldn't afford a hangover. Jeanette was curled up on the couch in her sweatpants. For the first time since Monday, her eyes weren't red and puffy. We need to talk. Please don't shut me out. What's there to talk about? You thought you were going to die, so you tried to sleep together before you died. You don't understand. What don't I understand? Tatiana and I had a long talk about death. Our communication was verbal, not sexual. We had the same problems as you. Are we going to freeze to death? Would we starve to death? Would they find our skeletons in the spring when the snow melts? Unlike you, however, we wondered if each of you had survived. How were your concerns different? The tears came again. There were none. We were talking about you guys. And then you decided we were probably dead. Let's have sex. Dale, no, that's not what happened. So why was it? I don't know. I guess I was weak and scared. I'm not strong like you. Are you going to divorce me? I don't want a divorce. I really don't know. I get goosebumps when I'm around you. The pain of betrayal is too strong. Can I at least hold you? Opening my arms, Jeanette wasted no time in crushing my ribs. Her sobs continued for several minutes before our embrace was broken. Good night, Jeanette. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, Dale. I love you. That was the first time I had to deal with betrayal. If I'd been through it once or twice in high school or college, I'd know there was a tomorrow. Right now, I wasn't sure. I just couldn't understand how supposed love had given way to lust. For the next few weeks, we lived at a standstill. I wish I had Tatiana's phone number. Was she really divorcing Steve? If so, is she leaving? Have you talked to Tatiana? Not since she barged into my room Monday morning. I'm never contacting her again. She wasn't very nice. Her language was very rude. She complimented you on being a gentleman and her hero. She told me you knew everything. That's why I cried when you showed up. You told your parents? Fred got suspicious right away. Not exactly. I was hoping we could get through this. The way things are going, that doesn't seem likely, does it? I thought our flame was red hot, but you put it out. I just don't feel close to you. Something inside me is dead. We'll see how the next month goes, and then I'll decide. Jeanette's eyes glistened with tears. My soul was dead. I felt nothing. Four more weeks, and I was still emotionally dead next to Jeanette. Jeanette, where are we? 
Can you give me one good reason why we shouldn't split up? Because you're giving up on us. I did something I'll always regret, but it wasn't planned. It just happened. I call bullshit. Nothing just happens. It happened because you wanted it to. Jeanette was very annoyed. Not true. Damn it. As far as I know, you and Tatiana were together. As calmly as possible. So that's the game you want to play? Okay. How long were you lovers? I bet it was great to see Steve again, wasn't it? Maybe it was the first time with Steve, but I wonder how many others there were. Jeanette pulled her knees up to her chest and squeezed herself into a lump. Every accusation I made was like a slap in the face. Did you use our bedroom or just the motels? Whatever you were doing, you managed to keep me in the dark. There you go. Are you happy now? I'm sorry, Dale. I shouldn't have said that. There are no others. There never were. It was just a terrible decision on my part and only when we were trapped. Please, can't we try to move past this? One thing I can tell you for sure, Jeanette, you've just decided our fate. I wanted a woman strong enough to resist. Now I know you'll always think of me as a fraud. And I'll always have to deal with the question of whether you've found another set of circumstances that make you cheat again. I'm too young to live like this. I'm filing for divorce. Oh, God, no, please, Dale, I don't want to lose you. Jeanette, I have to move on. My skin no longer gets goosebumps when I'm around you. The only feeling left is pain. You couldn't have plunged the knife deeper into my heart. I'm going to have my lawyer file a divorce petition. You'll be served here. There's no need to make this public. Jeanette's eyes were moist, and his voice was cracked. I'm really afraid. I won't contest it. What will happen to our house? I think we should sell it. I don't want it, and I doubt you can afford it. With a strangled reply, okay. Two days later, Jeanette was served at home. It was only fair, since we didn't have much to share. I would have to pay a nominal amount of alimony for two years. Since it was uncontested, the divorce was granted in less than 90 days. Jeanette tried her best to get me to relent, but I couldn't. Or maybe I didn't want to. I moved out shortly after the papers were filed. As predicted, since Jeanette couldn't afford the mortgage, the house was sold, and what little was left was split in half. Jeanette went to her parents' house first. She moved a few months later, but I don't know where she moved to. When I think of her, I get angry and sad again. Getting revenge on Steve was tempting, but he wasn't worth it. If he's smart, he'll avoid me since I might change my mind about revenge. While the divorce process was going on, some of my longtime friends were doing their best to set me up with available ladies. Although I went on a few dates, I was emotionally dead. The thought of starting a relationship landed with a thud. Is this something I should look forward to? Five months had passed since the avalanche. After attending several invitation-only job fairs, I received two very lucrative offers. I loved my current job, but it really couldn't compete with these offers. They told me this when I shared my offers with them. I got a place on the West Coast, near Palo Alto. My stuff fit comfortably in my car. My new apartment was no more lonely than the previous one. And it wasn't any better either. I needed a personal life that included women. I didn't know what I wanted out of life anymore. One such evening, I remembered all those text messages I'd composed. Reading them warmed my soul. Telling those you love how much they mean to you was uplifting. I decided I had to start living the life of a single person. I felt like I was spying or reading someone's diary. One by one, I read the texts that Tatiana had composed. She was much more talented in her writing. When I read her letter to her mother, my heart raced. I may not have married the man of my dreams, but at least I will die in his arms. Jeanette is so lucky. I had to find a way to contact Tatiana. Jeanette's phone number no longer worked. I decided it would be cruel to ask her to do that anyway. Thinking back to the conversations I'd had with Tatiana while waiting for our rescue, I thought I knew what city her parents lived in. One of the photo albums I picked up had pictures of our wedding along with a newsletter. That gave me Tatiana's maiden name. It didn't take long to find her parents. I left a message for her mother to call me. Cell phone rings. Dale? Tatiana, is that really you? How are you? Oh, Dale, I'm so glad you called. I missed you so much. I'm doing great. What's going on in your world? I got my master's degree and a job on the West Coast. I've only been here a month. 
Is Jeanette with you? No, I just couldn't get past that. We've been divorced for months. What about you? Still with Steve? No, same as you. We lived together for a couple months, but it was too hard for me. God, I'm so glad you called. What brought this on? Last week, I was throwing myself another self-pity party, and I found these lyrics we wrote when we thought we were gonna die. Reading them made me feel better. Wow, I forgot all about them. Uh-oh. I bet you read mine too, huh? The man of your dreams, huh? I never knew. She was my best friend. Best friends never let things like that be known. So where are you now? Chicago. You said West Coast? Where? Palo Alto. We have an office in San Jose. How close is that? Palo Alto is about 20 miles from San Jose, the airport I usually use. Maybe I can talk my boss into letting me visit that office. Or maybe I should consider visiting the Windy City. Really, Dale? It would be so nice to see you. I'm not doing anything this weekend. I'm pretty familiar with where the airport is so I can pick you up. How about you check the flights for Friday night? Can you find me a place to stay? Uh, yeah, let me work on that. Well, you know I didn't want any trouble with your guys. I'll deal with them. Are you sure your girlfriends are gonna let you go? Just like you, I'll deal with them. If worse comes to worse, I'll bring some with me. That's a great idea. They can entertain my boys while you and I play checkers. I love your sense of humor, Tatiana. And that's just one of the many things I love about you, Dale. We talked for another 90 minutes. It was so nice to hear her voice again. So many good memories came flooding back. It was all I could do to not think about Jeanette. But I managed. Friday, I went to work early and left around 11 a.m. When I flew into Chicago, I texted Tatiana that I was headed to the passenger pickup. Dale, over here! I picked Tatiana up and spun her around as we hugged. I got the warmest kiss this year. Glad you could make it. Hungry? Yeah, I should probably get something to eat. Take me to your favorite place. Let's go? You want to drive? Not really. You can take the driver's seat just in case you need to relieve yourself. Giggling. Can you believe what we had to do? I've remembered that ordeal so many times. It was something. After a great dinner at the Texas Roadhouse, Tatiana drove back to the highway. My heart slowed a little as she pulled into the Holiday Inn parking lot. My out-of-town guests usually stay here. I have other plans for you, she said with a twinkle in her eye. It can't hurt, can it? Only if you resist, I'm not going to resist. As soon as we were in Tatiana's apartment, she threw herself into my arms. Kiss me. Slow tongue touches were replaced by earnest mouth massages. My hands wandered, but much slower than Tatiana's. Pushing me back, my jacket and shirt were sensuously ripped off. Your turn. I pulled Tatiana's blouse out of her pants, then unbuttoned her blouse from the bottom up. Tatiana pulled my head to her breast. I didn't need any further instructions. We pressed against each other, face to face this time. Can I get you anything? Some Viagra? How about a drink or a snack? Not really. I'd rather hug you. After cleaning up, we fell asleep under the blanket. I heard the sound of the shower pouring as the sunlight warmed my face. Standing naked and wiping her hair with a towel, Tatiana greeted me. Good morning, my love. Did you enjoy last night? Was it a dream or reality? I had both. You lasted a lot longer in my dreams. I, I gave her the tongue. Get your ass out of bed. We got all day. It was a wonderful weekend. Sunday night, we parted ways, having previously agreed that Tatiana would fly to San Jose in two weeks. As my turn to have fun came to an end, I realized that I was falling in love with Tatiana. Her face when we broke up told me that she might be experiencing the same feelings. I received confirmation in the middle of the week. Good evening, Tatiana. How's work going this week? Very well, Dale, which is why I'm calling you. They have an opening in the San Jose office. I... And I checked and qualified. I... I have strong feelings for you, but if you don't feel the same way, I'll back off. And if I said, I think I'm falling in love with you, would that help you make a decision? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, that would help. Or yes, would you still consider changing jobs? 
smart ass. Yes, I love you and I'm going to take the job. We talked for another hour. I was tasked with finding a suitable apartment for us within a reasonable distance of her office, the airport, and my office. As soon as she was approved for the position, the suitcases were packed. It had only been six weeks since she had called me back. Sometimes life moves at the speed of an avalanche. We were in no hurry. We both had deep-seated anxiety issues regarding relationships. Although we had a few screaming fits, we always managed to kiss and cuddle before bed. I work with a lot of young women and it bothers Tatiana. She travels with men and it annoys me. It was during one of our conversations ten months after we started living together, we came to an understanding. I'm sorry, Tatiana, I was being an ass. If you can keep your vows when circumstances force you to sleep with the man of your dreams, then I have nothing to worry about when you're on the road. I don't trust men, so please, avoid those situations that put you at risk. Listen to me, Dale. I was unfairly petty when I said you work with all those women. You proved to me in the avalanche that you can be trusted. I may not trust the women you work with, but I'm convinced I can trust you. We stared at each other in silence for a minute. Then I got down on one knee. I don't have a ring or anything since this happened pretty quickly. But would you like to die in this man's arms or in your dreams? Pushing me back onto my back, then pressing his chest against me. Would I die quickly, or what do you have in mind? A very slow death, fifty or sixty years of agony. Sign me up for company. Epilogue. We enjoyed a small wedding ceremony in San Jose, and then a honeymoon as far away from the snow as possible. We never skied again, nor did we have the desire to. Our careers became our children, but eight years later we expanded our family when Sarah was born. She looks just like her mother. Her sister Maggie came along two years later, and she's going to have a little harder time since she looks a lot like me. We learned through social media that Steve had remarried and fathered a child. We also learned that Jeanette had moved to Maryland and had two children. Neither Steve nor Jeanette made any attempt to contact us, nor did we contact them. That relationship was buried under an avalanche.